Again, our subject tonight is history's great deception. There is a well-known game that street hustlers play often to, um, to take money from unsuspecting marks. Many of you probably know this game. It's called the shell game. In the shell game, what they do is that they will take a little object like a pea and they'll put it under something like walnut shells and then the person comes by and, oh, come over, come over. I, I will bet you that you can't guess which shell has the pea under it after I move them around. Okay, go ahead and try it. So he moves them around, the person guesses, and voila, they're correct. He said, would you like to make a little wager that you can't do that again? And so the person said, oh, small wager, 50 cents, a dollar, sure. And then he moves them around and he lets the guy win. And then he does it a few more times and each time the person wins. Then he raises the ante to where there's a good size piece of money there on the table of what he wants to take from the mark. And then when the wager is such where he wants to take the mark's money, he manipulates those shells in such a way that the guy could not possibly find that object. And consequently, he loses his money. Well, just like the street hustler, Satan is a con man, he is a liar, and he is a thief. And tonight... We're going to see how he has managed to pull off the greatest deception in human history. Now, what deception might that be this evening that I'm speaking of? Well, as astonishing as it sounds, Satan has convinced most of the Christian world that we do not have to keep all of God's commandments. He's convinced most people that they are at liberty to change the commandment of God and insert a version of their own choosing. Oh, yes, they'll say, we see it right here in the Bible. I can read it, but we don't have to obey that one. We don't have to keep the fourth commandment as God himself has instructed. Now, turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 16. You should have a handout with the scriptures on them or feel free to follow along in your own Bibles if you can get to the text quickly enough. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. And this is what it says. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, Unto all good works. Now, how many people here tonight believe what this scripture says? Amen. You see, the only place that a Christian, that is one who has faith in Jesus Christ, will go for their doctrine is the Bible. See, doctrine from any other source could very well be wrong. Only doctrine that's based on the word of God is going to carry us through into the kingdom. It's profitable for reproof, it says. If we have faith in Jesus, when we are corrected by the word of God, we actually receive it with joy. Why? That the man of God, I'm reading here, may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, I hope everyone that's here tonight will agree with me that Jesus is our only perfect example. Jesus came to this world a little over 2,000 years ago, and he lived here among men. Why? To show us how to live. The apostle Peter tells us that Jesus left us an example that we should follow his steps. We read that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Simply put, a Christian follows Christ. Well, let me talk to this side over here. Somebody might say amen. <laughs> Simply put, a Christian follows Christ. 
Amen. First John 2, 6 says, He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. And then Jesus said this in Luke 6, 46. He says, And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Now, I want to be very clear on this before we get further in this subject. The Sabbath issue. That is, whether or not to keep the seventh day Sabbath as commanded by God in the Ten Commandments is not just about a day. It is no more just about a day than the issue in the Garden of Eden was about a piece of fruit. Both the fruit and the day represent something much larger. It more importantly represents who are you going to worship and serve and who are you going to obey? Not what, not when, but who. Who will you choose to obey? Now, the Sabbath issue, that is to keep the Sabbath as God commanded us, presents us with the exact same choice. It's no different. Now, I want to be clear about that. It's a matter of who you choose to obey. I'm going to try to make this abundantly clear tonight. Now, I think it's ironic that in most Christian churches, and I have done this, by the way, I can go in and I can preach on any of the Ten Commandments Oh, I can wax eloquent on thou shall not steal. And everybody will say, hallelujah, amen, brother. And I can preach till the rafters come down on thou shall not commit adultery. And everybody will say, amen, hallelujah, brother. Honor your father and mother. Amen, hallelujah, brother. But as soon as I say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, another spirit comes into the room. Where does that spirit come from and why? Now, if you knew for certain which day Jesus would keep if he were living on earth in person right now, would you follow in his steps? Would you follow his example? Is it possible for us to know which day Jesus would keep if he were here? I think it is. I think the Bible makes it abundantly clear. Let's look at um, Luke 4.16. This is what it says. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was. Now, tell me this. What is a custom? Is that something that you do periodically every once in a while? Or is a custom something that you do all the time? All the time. A custom is what you normally do. It's a normal course of your life. Your life. He says, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, when Jesus was here as an obedient son of his father, he kept the seventh-day Sabbath as specified in the Ten Commandments. Now, let's read that commandment, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. This is what it says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. But the seventh day, please note, dear friends, it doesn't say a seventh day. I was talking to a minister friend of mine several months ago, and um, from where I used to be, and we went out to lunch, and we were talking about that. He said, oh, you believe? I said, I said, yes, I believe. He says, I believe in the Sabbath too. I said, you do? Praise the Lord. I didn't know that. He says, yes, I do. He says, Monday is my Sabbath. <laughs> he says, because I have to work around the church on Sunday, so I take Monday off as a day of rest. It doesn't say, friends, a seventh day. It says the seventh day. It is a specific day. If I say to you, give me the pen or give me the object, 
I'm not saying give me a pen or any object. There's a specific one that I'm talking about. Am I right or wrong? He says, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger that is within your gates. Then he tells us why. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, let me ask you this question, friends. Has Jesus changed? No. The Bible clearly says, Hebrews 13, verse 8, for Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and for how long? Forever. So if Jesus is the same today that if he has not changed, he would keep the same seventh day Sabbath if he was walking on this earth today that he kept when he was walking on the earth 2,000 years ago. If we truly follow Jesus, truly want to follow him, what else can we do except keep the same day holy as he kept holy? Now, let's look closely and we're going to see what the Bible teaches on this subject point by point. Now, the first point we'll, we'll mark with a plain statement from Scripture. Revelation 1.10. This is what it says. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now, this text tells us that John... On the island of Patmos, the Isle of Patmos, says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, no matter what people think, according to the Bible, the Lord has a day. John says he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, this particular scripture doesn't say which day it is. It doesn't say when it starts. It doesn't say when it ends. But it does tell me that the Lord Jesus has a day. So let that be our first marker in Scripture. Now, when I give the concluding text toward the end, all the other texts in the, in the middle will have to line up with these. Now turn with me to Mark chapter 2, verse 27. And he said unto me, The Sabbath was made for who? For man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So the Sabbath was not made for the Jews or for any particular race of people. According to the Bible, the Sabbath was made for man or all mankind. Now here we're not told which day of the week the Lord's day is, but we're told by Jesus himself that his day, the Lord's day, is the Sabbath. I conclude that because if he's the Lord of the, uh, uh, of the day, it certainly must be his day. Now, we found in Revelation 1.10 that he has a day, and here we find that he is Lord of the Sabbath. If Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, then the Sabbath must be the Lord's day. But let's look further. Turn with me to Isaiah 53, 58, rather, verse 13. And this is what he says. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on what? My holy day. And call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord. Honorable and shall honor him. Not doing thine own ways, not finding thine own pleasure, not speaking thine own words. Then shall thy delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man. He says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath, and he calls the Sabbath my holy day. No other day in all of the scripture, friends, has that distinction. No other one. Now, note that Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man. If the Sabbath was made for man, then who made it and when? Well, turn with me to John 1.1. 1, 1. We will find the answer in the Bible. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So who made the Sabbath? Jesus did. In fact, it's who? It's his holy day. And when did he make it? In the beginning. Now remember, Revelation 1.10 tells us that the Lord has a day. Mark 2.28 says it's the Sabbath because he's the Lord of it. Mark 2.27, that the day was made for man. And John 1.13 informs us that Jesus made all things, so Jesus made the day. Now we need to learn which day of the week it is and when it begins and ends. Turn with me back now to Exodus. We'll go back to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 10. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Why is it, why is it the Sabbath of the Lord. Because he made it. Who did he make it for? He made it for man. Now let's turn to Genesis chapter 2 and we'll see how he made it. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. And this is what it says. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. At creation, friends, not Mount Sinai, how many Jews were there when God did this? Huh? Not a single one. At creation, he made the Sabbath by three acts. First, God rested on the seventh day, and then God blessed the seventh day, and then after he rested on it, the Bible says he sanctified it because he had rested from all his works. He didn't bless it and sanctify it, to make it the Sabbath until he had completed all of the work of creation and only after he himself had rested on it. Now, which day was man created? He was created on the sixth day. So the first full day of man's life, you know what lesson he learned on the first full day of his life? Was how to rest and have fellowship with God on the Sabbath. Now, this is at the heart of the great Sabbath deception. The devil wants to draw attention away from God as the creator of all things. You see, he wants to exalt himself above God. You see, recognition of the Sabbath is, in fact, recognition and worship of the God of creation. It points to the creator, and that's why Satan hates this day. He hates this message that we're preaching tonight. And through keeping holy, the very day that God said to keep holy, as a memorial of his creation, we embrace the God of creation and we reject the counterfeit God of this world. Sabbath is about relationship with God. And Jesus Christ is the Lord of the day, which he himself has made for rest and fellowship with God. It's God's gift to mankind. He made it for man. Remember first, the Lord has a day. The Bible says so. That day is called the Sabbath or the rest day. It was made in the beginning after the completed work of creation. Fourthly, God himself rested on that day. Do you think God was tired? <laughs> huh? Do you think God said, oh, I'm all worn out. I work six days now. I've got, to lay, I've got to lay down and rest. No. What did God do that for? He did it for us. God rested on that day for our benefit, friends. And fifth, and after God rested on that day, 
God blessed and sanctified it, and then he gave it as a gift to man. Now, the cycles of time are connected with the heavenly bodies. For example, we count a year because that's how long it takes the earth to make one rotation around the sun, measured by the heavenly bodies. We count a month because that's how long it takes the earth, I mean the moon, to make one revolution around the earth. We count a day because that's how long it takes the earth to make one revolution on its own axis, 24 hours. Why do we have a seven-day week? Nothing happens up there in seven days. Why do we have a seven-day week? You know why? Because in six days, God created the heaven and earth, and on the seventh day, he rested. And that cycle's been going on ever since creation. Amen. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God, who at many times and in various manners spoke in the time past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So we see here that Christ was the active agent of the Father at creation. And he, Christ, is called Lord and God. The same God tells us how he made the Sabbath, the Sabbath by resting on that day and putting his own blessings in it. And he sanctified it and he set it apart for a holy use. He put his own presence there on purpose. And friends, it's still there today. God has not changed it at all. Christ made the Sabbath in the beginning, and he said that it was made for man, that is, all mankind. Therefore, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as one who has a surrendered heart and life to God, I keep the Bible Sabbath, the Lord's Day, the seventh-day Sabbath to honor and nurture relationship with Jesus Christ and Christ alone. In his commandments, the Lord makes it plain that we are to keep the seventh day of the week for three primary reasons. First, preceding the seventh day, he worked. He made the world in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day, not because he was tired, but because he was doing it for us. And then after he rested on that day for our benefit, he turned around, he blessed, and he hallowed. He made this 24-hour period holy. Now, since it takes the same power to redeem man, as it did to create him in the first place. The Sabbath stands not only as a sign of the great creative power of Jesus Christ to make the world in six days, but it also stands for the great redemptive power of Christ to recreate us and to make us new creatures. The Sabbath is expressly said in Scripture to be the sign of sanctification. It says in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 12, moreover, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Every time we keep Sabbath, I keep Sabbath every week. We show that we are worshiping the true Lord and who is the God who made the earth in six days, we are showing by our following in his steps and his example and his commandment that we are, we are worshiping him and we are accepting the power, the same power to change us and save us from our sins. It's the same power. It's the same God. The observance of the seventh day becomes a blessed sign between Jesus Christ and us that he is our redeemer. Now, the Bible is our only source of scriptural truth, and these scriptural truths stand out in the word of God. The seventh day is the only day, according to scripture, on which the Lord ever rested, 
so as to make it a rest day for man. It's the only one. The seventh day is the only day that God ever blessed for man to keep. The seventh day is the only recurring weekly day that God ever set apart for man to observe. The seventh day is the only recurring weekly day to which God ever gave any sacred title. The seventh day is the only recurring weekly day that God ever made holy for man to keep. The seventh day is the only recurring weekly day that God has ever commanded man to keep. These six truths should prove that the seventh day is the only right day to keep according to the Bible. Now, do you love Jesus tonight? I believe that everybody in the room does. And if you do, are you ready to follow him and keep the seventh day, which Christ, our creator and our redeemer, has blessed and sanctified for us? What else could we do as Christians, knowing that Jesus is our perfect savior, and our perfect example. Now, listen closely. If we have committed any sin, and we come confessing that sin to God in Jesus' name, his perfect, sinless life, and the sacrifice of that perfect, sinless life, it covers our sins, and we receive forgiveness, and we make it into heaven by virtue of his perfect, sinless life and sacrifice. If I have stolen and I come and confess my sin, Jesus' perfect, sinless life, because he never stole, there is atonement in his life for my sin of stealing. And because of his sinless life and sinless sacrifice, my sin is atoned for If I have been covetous, he never was. So when I come and confess my sin of covetousness, his perfect sinless life and perfect sinless sacrifice covers that sin. If I've worshipped false gods, he never did. If any of God's commandments that, that I have broken on any level, if I come and confess them, Jesus perfect sinless life, and his sacrifice cover that sin. Now, if Sunday is the Lord's day, then Sunday breaking would be a sin. And if that is true, then I'm lost, and you're all lost. You know why? Because Jesus never kept Sunday. He worked on the first day of the week. There would be nothing in in the atonement to cover the sin of Sunday breaking because Jesus never kept that day. What Jesus offers us in his perfect atonement is perfect Sabbath keeping to cover our sin of breaking the fourth commandment. So when I come and confess my sin... He never did that. Sinless sacrifice covers my sin. You see, he only offers us perfect Sabbath keeping to cover the sin of breaking that commandment. He observed the Sabbath because he is a perfect Savior and he was our perfect example from the day he came into this world until the day He left, and he left us a perfect path to follow. Again, 1 Peter 2.21, we read this earlier. Now we need to read it again. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. See, when Christ finished his work of creation, he rested on the Sabbath day. And then he came and walked among men, and he offered The perfect sacrifice where he kept all of his father's commandments. He says so in the word. I have kept my father's commandments. And then he 
paid the price for our redemption on the cross. He cried, it is finished. And then, just as he rested from creation on the Sabbath, he rested from redemption on the Sabbath. He rested from creation and he rested from redemption on the same day. The Sabbath truly, friends, is the Lord's day. Now, men commonly count their days from midnight to midnight. That's the system that, system that we use today. Well, that system came from the Romans. God counts days from sunset to sunset. Genesis 1.5, he says, and, the, <clears throat> and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the dark part of the day in God's reckoning of time comes first. And the light part of the day is the second half of the day, the evening and the morning, the first day. And we see an example of this in Mark chapter 1, verse 32. In Mark 1, 32, the people, this was a Sabbath. They were, see, they weren't going to do anything on the Sabbath to violate. The, they were very, very stick, much sticklers about this. So they waited until the sun went down. And when the sun went down, that started the first day of the week. And at evening, when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. So they waited till the sun went down. And when the sun goes down, that begins the next day. Now, we do not keep the seventh-day Sabbath from midnight to midnight. We keep the Bible seventh-day Sabbath of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is from sunset on Friday till sunset on Saturday. It's a sign of Christ's creative power. And friends, please hear me. Satan opposes what I'm saying to you tonight with every deception at his disposal. We're going to see later in this series why he hates this day so much. Now, the vast majority of Christian churches today teach the observance of Sunday, which is the first day of the week. And that is the time for rest and for worship and for fellowship. Yet it's generally known and freely admitted, study history yourself, that the early Christians observed the seventh day as the Sabbath. Now, how did this change come about? Now, some of my Sunday-keeping family and friends, and I have lots of them, They'll tell me that they observe Sunday as the Lord's Day because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. Yes, Jesus, after resting in the grave on Sabbath, did rise from the grave according to the Bible on the first day of the week. But where in the Bible does it say one word about Sunday being the Lord's Day? One word. Where in the Bible does Jesus say, I am the Lord of the Sunday? Where in the Bible does it say that Sunday is a holy day unto the Lord? I will tell you where in the Bible it says that. Nowhere. <laughs> Nowhere. You can't find a text. What changed in Genesis chapter 2? when Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week? What changed in Genesis chapter 2? You can answer. Nothing! <laughs> what changed in the Ten Commandments when Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week? What changed in the Ten Commandments? Nothing! This is what the Bible says. I am the Lord, I change not. Now, history reveals that it was decades after the death of the apostles that a political religious system essentially took over the Christian church. This system, the papal church of Rome, repudiated the Sabbath of Scripture and substituted the observance of the first day of the week. Now, this was a gradual process. It didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual process, and it culminated 
with the church adopting mandates and laws to enforce Sunday keeping. Now, here are some of the contributing factors to those decisions. The Jews in the Roman Empire were unpopular and they were persecuted. The Romans didn't like them at all. The Christians and Jews shared the same Sabbath, so that presented a problem for the Christians who did not want to be associated with the Jews. And then, in order to be attractive to pagans, the church began to accept pagan customs and to integrate pagan customs into the church. Sun worship was predominant in the Roman culture and empire. And sun, Sunday was the day of worship for the sun god. So the church, through compromise and paganism, steadily moved away from worshiping the god of creation on his holy day and substituted Sunday, a pagan day of worship, and called it the Lord's Day. I don't know about you, friends, but I have decided to follow the Jesus of Scripture and the God of creations and not the directives and traditions of men. I've made that decision. I don't care what it costs. I'm going to follow Jesus. Now, the following quotations, I'm going to share with you some quotations. And they are all from Roman Catholic sources. I'm going to quote them the way the Roman Catholic sources wrote them. They freely acknowledge that there is no biblical authority for the observance of Sunday, that it was the Roman church that changed Sabbath to Sunday, the first day of the week. And they are rather... Almost proud of the fact. Because you see, in their theology, the church is above the Bible. And that's their belief system. So they believe that the church can change Scripture. We who are Protestants, we say, the Bible and the Bible only. They laugh at the Protestants who make that statement because, in essence, they're saying to us, you are following us. Let me read some quotations. This is from John Gilmary Shea. I'm sorry, this first one is from the Catholic press, Sydney, Australia. It says, Sunday is a Catholic institution, and its claim to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From beginning to end of Scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of of weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first. That's what they say. This is from John Gilmary Shea. He says, Protestantism, in discarding the authority of the church, the Roman Catholic Church, has no good reason for its Sunday theory and ought logically to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. Monsignor Louis Segur, plain talk about the Protestant. It says, he said, it was the Catholic Church, which by the authority of Jesus Christ, I don't think so, but this is what he says, has transferred this rest from the Bible Sabbath to Sunday. Thus, the observance of Sunday by the Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Catholic Church. The Brotherhood of St. Paul from the Clifton Tract. It says, we Catholics have... By the way, friends, we're not bashing Catholics. We love Catholics. God loves Catholics. I'm just reading what is written. I, I, I am. So uh, don't think that this is hate speech against Catholics. I, I, I want to see every Catholic in the kingdom. <laughs> Glory to God. I want to be there myself, too. <laughs> we Catholics, then, have the same authority for keeping Sunday holy 
instead of Saturday as we have for every other article of our creed, namely, listen, the authority of the church. Whereas you who are Protestants have really no authority for it, whatever. For there is no authority for it in the Bible, and you will not allow that there can be authority for it anywhere else. The Catholic Universe says, The church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. The Protestant claiming the Bible to be the only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, the Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. Now, this is what they wrote. I'm just reading what he wrote. I didn't put that in there. Wrote that back in 1942. James Cardinal Gibbon says, But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we never sanctify. The Catholic Virginian wrote, for example, nowhere in the Bible do we find that Christ or the apostles ordered that the Sabbath be changed from Saturday to Sunday, we have the commandment of God given to Moses to keep holy the Sabbath day, that is the seventh day of the week, Saturday. Today, most Christians keep Sunday because it has been revealed to us by the church outside the Bible. It's almost terrifying, friends. Father T. Enright, way back years and years ago, this is what he says. He says, I have, this is Catholic priest. He says, I have repeatedly offered $1,000. And back in the day when he wrote this, that was a lot of money. It's a lot of money now, by the way, to me. He says, I have repeatedly offered $1,000 to anyone who can prove to me from the Bible alone that I am bound to keep Sunday holy. There is no such law in the Bible. It is the law of the Holy Catholic Church alone. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Catholic Church says, no, by my divine power, I abolish the Sabbath day and command you to keep holy the first day of the week. And lo, the entire civilized world bow down in reverent obedience to the commandment of the Holy Catholic Church. Now, in addition to these dear Catholic brethren, many Protestants have come to the same conclusion that we are revealing tonight. William Owen Carver, he's a Baptist, and from his book, The Lord's Day and Our Day, he says, there was never any formal or authoritative change from the Jewish Sabbath day, I mean, from the Jewish seventh day Sabbath to the Christian first day observance. He says, there was never any change, authoritative change from scripture. Dwight L. Moody from his waiting and wanting, he says the Sabbath was binding in Eden and it has been in force ever since. The fourth commandment begins with the word remember, showing that the Sabbath already existed when God wrote the law on the tables of stone at Sinai. How can men claim that this one commandment has been done away with when they will admit that the other nine are still binding. Dwight Moody, T.C. Blake, a Presbyterian, doctor of divinity, he says, the Sabbath is part of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. This alone forever settles the question as to the perpetuity of the institution. Until, therefore, it can be shown that the whole moral law has been repealed the Sabbath will stand. The teaching of Christ confirms the perpetuity of the Sabbath. Presbyterian. 
Now, these are but a few quotations out of many that I could have shared that clearly show that Christian scholars from all backgrounds acknowledge the clarity of God's word on this subject. Now, I've told you before that I was a Pentecostal preacher for over 25 years, and I was. And actually, in many respects, I think I still am a Pentecostal preacher. (laughs) But in 1997, I had a very tragic event that happened in my life. It's called divorce. As a minister in the Pentecostal church, I went through a divorce. At the time, I was working in a church. I wasn't a, the senior pastor there. I was one of uh, a few of the several ministers that worked with the senior pastor at this particular church, 5,000 member church. And 1997, I went through this event, divorce. And when this happened, without going through all the sordid details of it, not a pleasant thing, but the senior pastor called me into the office and said, well, Brother Tim, I'm going to have to sit you down. In other words, to remove me from my office of ministry, I would not be allowed to stand in front of the congregation and preach or teach or do any of those things because, you know, the Bible says if you can't take care of your own house, then how can you manage the house of God? And so I'm going to sit you down and uh, you will have be removed from all of your places of ministry. Well, at the time... I was dean of the Bible college. I was head of the prison ministries. We would go to, I think I probably preached in prisons more than any place else. Prison ministries. We also had a hundred cell groups throughout the city, and I oversaw those, as well as other functions. But I was removed from from those areas of, of ministry. And at that time also, I had, we had two houses in, I owned two houses in Sacramento. The house that my wife and I lived in, you know, the, the, the big house with uh, all the little accoutrements of, of success, all the trappings, you know, the, um, the trinkets that people strive for that are so important that ultimately are worthless, and and we had that house, and then we had the little house that I had bought for my mother over in South Sacramento, um, and at the divorce, we lost the big, actually, I didn't lose it, we kind of, the market wasn't so good, sold it at a loss, didn't get a dime out of it. And then my, my ex-wife and daughter moved to Oklahoma, and my son and I moved into the little house with my mother. Betty, you'll know where that little house is. My son and I moved in there with my mother and my stepfather, who is now deceased. And I had, I went from a big home to a 10 by 10 bedroom. And my son had a 10 by 10 bedroom next to me. During this period, friends, I will just be very honest with you. I, in retrospect, I'm looking back at it. I begin to sink into what I can recognize now as a state of depression. Although externally, I did a good job of masking things. Externally, people would interact with me. They couldn't see the inner torment and pain that I was going through. But I was. And I began to, inside myself, withdraw 
more and more and more from things around me and only interacted with people on a superficial level. I withdrew completely from church. I felt that God had failed me and I had failed God. And the church had basically rejected me. So why should I go there? That was my, my thinking. Flawed to be sure, but that was my thinking. And I really sunk into this deep pit of darkness and quite frankly, a sense of despair. And for three years, I lived like that. I had a secular job. I would go to my job every day and try to put up my facade just to get through that day and then retreat back home and withdraw into my 10 by 10 little room. And my poor son, who really needed, just in junior high at the time, really needed some fathering and some, a better example. And unfortunately, I did the best I could under the circumstances, but he needed more than that. He got over it. But I saw myself in this place, friends, and I knew as time went by that ultimately I was going to just die in this condition. And honestly, people around me did not realize how bad off I was. Now, during this three-year period, how many times do you think the senior pastor from that big church called me up and said, Brother Tim, I, I know you're going through a tough time right now. I want to come over and pray with you. How many times do you think that happened? Zero. How many times do you think they called me on the phone just to see how I was doing? Zero. Not one phone call. Not one visit. Nothing. Why should I go there? I recall sitting many nights, all night, in my little 10 by 10 room. And sometimes I'd be up all night long and go out the next day. After three years of living like that, I decided that I needed to do something because I really didn't want to die in that condition. And I had not thrown away all belief in God. I just didn't think that God and I had any connection and we didn't. At least I didn't think so. And I'd sit there sometimes in that little dark room and had a little television in there and lay in the bed with the remote control just going from channel to channel to channel. Watch one channel for a few minutes and go to the next channel for a few minutes and go to the next channel for a few minutes. Sometimes I do that all night long. I didn't want to die like that. And after three years of this darkness, I came to the conclusion that there must be some help for me somewhere, and I believed I had enough. I was born and raised a Pentecostal. Born and raised. It wasn't like I, I just was converted. I was born into the church. I think the, I learned to read on the Bible, I think. Those little cards they used to have for you. And, and I believe that or I just hoped or something, that if I go to the Bible, maybe God would do something if I started reading the Bible. And so I did. Three years into this, I was trying to save my life and giving God one last chance to please help me out. And I thought, well, the way to do it is to start at the book of Genesis and just read through the whole Bible. There's got to, if there is, there is an answer, I don't want to miss it. I'll start at Genesis and I'll read through 
the Bible. So I started reading at Genesis chapter 1. Now, how many of you know that it doesn't take long for you to go from Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 2? Not very long. Now, I came to Genesis chapter 2, and I read the text that we talked about tonight. On the seventh day, God ended his work he had done and rested on the seventh day. And I thought, somehow, there was something about that text that I knew that I did not understand, even though I had been preaching for all those years, there was something there that I had missed. And so... I just filed it away. Lord, there's something here, but I kept reading. Now, how many even know, it doesn't take long to start reading at Genesis, that to get to Exodus chapter 20. Well, I got to Exodus chapter 20, and I read the Ten Commandments. It said, remember the Sabbath day. And I said, remember, remember what? And it was like the Lord impressed on me. It was one of the neatest things. I felt a spiritual impression. And it was, remember what I did in Genesis. Now I made a connection. I made a connection between Exodus 20 and creation, the fourth commandment. And I knew that there was something there that was important that I didn't know. And I wanted to know it. I really wanted to get it. So, I continued studying through the Bible, and there was lots of other things that were, that were relevant, but I kept coming back to, I want to understand this. Why was all my life, and, and by the way, I was, I was raised by some good people. These were good, godly, God-fearing people. It wasn't like they were, you know, a bunch of uh, quacks and phonies. These people really... Walk with the Lord to the best of their knowledge. I said, why was I raised all my life not knowing this and keeping the first day of the week and not what it says right here in the Bible? I said, there must be an answer in here. God somehow must have done something to change it, and I, I, and, and I didn't understand it. So I went on a quest to find the answer. I went through my Bible, and and even to this day, my regular habit is I read through my Bible cover to cover twice a year. Just go twice a year. Some people say, well, you should should dig into it and say, well, I do that too. But I also read it cover to cover twice a year, Genesis to Revelation, because there's so much good stuff there. Anyway, I decided that there must have been something that happened in history that changed all that. So I went to my computer, and I was looking, and I typed into my computer in my uh, 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 search engine the history of the Christian church because I knew that somewhere there must be something in there that would tell me how and when the date got changed so that I wouldn't feel all conflicted over this thing. So... I, pulled, I put that in my search engine and the, gave me several websites. The first website that came up was the Chronology of Christianity. And it was a Roman Catholic website. And I went to it and at that website, it had listed everything that happened in the Christian church from Jesus Christ all the way down to, the, I think the last entry was 1997. And I started going date by date by date, and it very rapidly degenerated into the history of the Roman Catholic Church. But to their credit, they listed everything that happened in every church. And then I got down to the year 321. And at the website, it says in 321, Constantine issued a decree, essentially changing the day of worship or the day of rest, it wasn't the day of worship, to the venerable day of the sun. I said, really? Now, I knew a little bit about Constantine from high school uh, world history. Who told him he could do that? 
you know. But he did it. And then I kept reading down through the, and I got to the year 364. And it said in 364 at the Council of Laodicea, the church had issued an edict, and basically, according to what they said, that everyone must keep the first day, Sunday, and not keep the seventh day. Anyone not complying would be punishable by death. That's what it said. I thought, wait a minute. Some person made this change. People made this change. It dawned on me. I mean, I got it. I mean, I'm, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I got that. <laughs> And I saw it. I said, people made this change. Why? So now I am energized to find out more about this. So I'm studying everything that I can, and I'm learning. I'm searching uh, things on the, on the Internet. I'm pulling up articles, and I'm studying, and I'm studying. And boy, I'm getting more and more and from not only about this, but about other things that I didn't quite understand, and I got a lot of clarity. And then one night as I was laying there in the bed, I was flicking through the channels, and I saw this guy on TV. You know, he had a wide part. And he was small, kind of like me. Actually, I think Doug's a little bigger than me. His name is Doug Batchelor. <laughs> And this guy was standing there. I mean, you know, now, I, I come from a Pentecostal background. We run all over the stage and preach and walk all up and down the aisles and everything. This guy was standing there in one spot <laughs> with his Bible and talking like he's talking to somebody in his living room. I mean, is that preaching? But, but he was just going through just talking like he's talking to somebody sitting there on the sofa. And everything that he was saying was resonating with what I've been reading in the Bible. And I said, this man's telling the truth. And I began to study right along with him. And I said, because everything he was saying, it resonated with what I had already found in Scripture. And it was like, wow. And he came on every night, and so every night I tune in, along with my regular, I tune in, and I'm just studying right along. And, and then he says that they, they offer this Bible study course through this organization called Amazing Facts. And if you would just go on to the, onto the internet, to our website, you can get this Bible study course. And so I went to the website. They recommend you do one lesson a week. I went through, I think they have 27, 28 lessons. I went through the whole thing in two days. I was like, or something like that, I was like a dry sponge that had just found some water. And I was soaking it up. And I became alive again. And the word, the more I read and studied, the, the more it changed me from the inside. This, this emptiness, this darkness began to gradually dissipate. And I began to be filled with the word of God as I studied. Amen. Now, I woke up, I, came, I became convinced that God had never changed the Sabbath. And that it was still the Sabbath today, just as it was in the Old Testament and the early New Testament church. It has never changed. Men changed it. And I decided one day, after I have gotten just full of truth, I decided that I'm going to keep the Sabbath. I had one big problem I had never done that before in my life. In fact, I didn't even know where there was a Sabbath-keeping church in Sacramento. I had never been to one in my life. I didn't pay you people any attention. 
you were not on my radar screen. We existed at a higher level, you see. <laughs> and so, and then I'm watching Doug Bachelor on TV, and they don't have an address where they're at. So I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, this guy has got a church called Amazing Facts, and all they have up there is a P.O. box in Roseville, California. So there's a church called Amazing Facts in Roseville, California, and they won't tell me where it's at. <laughs> but I woke up one Sabbath morning, Saturday morning. I've never gone to church on Sabbath in my life, except for we'd have a men's breakfast or men's fellowship or work day or something like that, but not for the purpose of going to church to worship God for keeping Sabbath. But I said, this is the Sabbath. I'm going to church. I don't know where I'm going. God, you'll have to direct me. I went out to the garage. I got in my car. I backed out of the garage, and I started driving down the street. I got to the first stop sign. I could go right or left. Normally, if I'm going out of that community, I go right to get the quickest way to get to the freeway. Today, I just decided to turn left. I turned left, and as I got to the next intersection... There was a couple coming out of their house, walking to the car that was in their driveway. And as clearly as I have sensed the Holy Spirit say anything to me in my life, he said to me, follow that car. <laughs> now, I don't know these people. I have never met them in my life. I have never spoken a word. I don't know who they are. It's Saturday morning. They could be going anywhere. But I knew that that was God who spoke to me. And so I sat there at the stop sign. They had gotten in their car, probably wondering, why is this guy still sitting there at the stop sign? And they were waiting for me to leave so they could back out of their driveway and go. They were on the corner lot. I'm not going anywhere until they go. And so... They back out of the driveway and start driving down the street. And so I just pulled in. I let them get a block or so down, and I pulled out there too. They drove down to the inner, uh, they drove down and drove around and got on uh, Highway 99. I'm in South Sacramento. They got on Highway 99 going north. I pulled in behind them, and, and they drove. Highway 99, they got to where 99 and the 50 cross, and they took 50 going west, which turns into 80, going to San Francisco. Okay. I, I'm still impressed to follow these people. I'm following them, and they take that highway to Interstate 5 going north. And they pull off of that freeway, and they get on Interstate 5. I've Pulling right behind them. I'm following them. I'm hoping that they don't notice me. But, but I am indeed following them. And they take, inter, they take Interstate 5 to 80, and they take 80 east. So they pull. And so I, Lord, where are these people going? And, and so I'm following. Then it dawns on me. I'm in Sacramento, Interstate 80 East goes to Reno. These people are going to Reno. People in Sacramento go to Reno to gamble, and these people are going to Reno to gamble, and you, dummy, are following them. <laughs> but I continue to follow them because that's the impression that I have. And I follow them, and then they get off. They don't stay on 80 too long. They get off in uh, Natomas over there, and I'm relieved because now I know they're not going to Reno. And so they started driving around surface streets. I'm still following them. They make a left. I don't know where they are now. They're over there someplace, that part of town. I, I don't know that part of town. They just turn here, turn there, and I'm following, trying to keep my distance. And then they drive into a high school parking lot. And I'm thinking, high school, parking lot. 
What happens on high, at high schools on Saturday? I don't know, sporting event? School play? Extracurricular activities? I'm at a high school. They park their car in the high school parking lot. I still have this strong impression to follow them. I park my car away from theirs. They don't look at me. And they get out of their car, and they head toward the campus of this school. And they walk onto the school grounds, and they go into an, uh, up to a door that opens to an auditorium. I'm standing there outside, and I let them walk in, and I walk up to the door. It was like, go home or go in. I said, hey, I followed them this far. I'm going to see what's going on here. I opened the door, walked into this high school auditorium, and there, on that Sabbath, there was a Seventh-day Adventist church having their Sabbath morning worship service. And God divinely and supernaturally directed me there. Now, let me fast forward here. After going there for a few weeks, you know, I got to meet some very nice people. You know, I got to meet people that like they're, they've been in this church for goodness, you know, Years and years, I meet someone, hi, how are you? He says, oh, I'm such and such. I said, good. He says, they, they say something like, well, I'm a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist. I said, well, I just walked in the door. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, that's how impressive I am. But I wanted, and I had this, you know, I wanted to find this guy I saw on TV. He wasn't at that place. And so... I asked around after going there, nice people, and they said, oh, that's Doug Batchelor. His church is, is, is across town, Sacramento Central Church. So I said, good, can you tell me where it is? Oh, they told me where it was. So after church, I decided I'd drive over there, and just, I knew church would be over, but I'd go in and find a bulletin, and then I'd know what time they started so I could come there the next Sabbath because I wanted to meet this man. And so the next, uh, but as I was driving over there, I had this little conversation with God. I've met some really nice people, wonderful, loving people. But you know what? Most of these people have been here for a long time. I'd like to meet somebody like me. I can't be the only person you're speaking to like this. There must be somebody else. Can you let me meet somebody like that? Well, when I got over to Sacramento Central, sure enough, church was over. There's just a few people milling around. The people have gone home. I walked into the door, and I'm in this huge foyer, and I look down, and I see a man that I know, Anthony. I run over to him. He used to be at the church that I came from. <clears throat> and I asked him, Anthony, what are you doing here? He said, this is my church. I said, you're kidding me. He says, yes, how long have you been? Oh, I've been coming here for a few years now. Really? And while I'm talking to him, here comes another guy. His name was Michael. Michael, I know him. What are you doing here? This is my church. You're kidding. While I'm talking to him, here comes a third guy. I said, what are you guys all doing here? They said, brother, you need some material to study. And they started loading me up with all these books and tapes. And <laughs> now, let me fast forward three years from that day. Pretty quickly, they asked me to be an elder in the church. After I came in, I was baptized in 2002. They made me an elder in the church, and I was working in the church in different capacities. One Tuesday or Wednesday, I got a phone call from Pastor Mike Thompson, associate pastor at Sacramento Central. He said to me, Tim, <clears throat> Pastor Doug's out of town. I'm scheduled to preach on Sabbath. But I was just, I feel impressed to ask if you'd like to preach. I said, you want me to preach on Sabbath? Now, I don't... Pastor Mike has never heard me preach a day in his life. 
I don't even know how he even knows that I do that. I, I really don't. But he's calling me and asking me to preach at Sacramento Central on Sabbath for the first time. I said, sure, I'll do that. Sabbath morning, I come there. I'm standing there. And at Sacramento Central, when you're preaching, you've got four TV cameras pointing at you, and you're literally being broadcast around the world. And I shared my sermon, and then I told a little bit of this testimony that I'm sharing with you tonight. And I got to the part about how I was in this state of depression in this, my little dark room, and how I was sitting there and flipping through the channels, and I saw this man preaching a message that was so clear and so powerful but it was so simple and unpretentious. And how I listened and how I studied and how God changed my life. And I said, and he was standing, and at that moment I looked down and I realized that I was standing in the exact same spot. Three years later, God had brought me from my little dark bedroom and now I'm on the other side of the camera, standing in the same spot of the man that I saw preaching truth to me. It took everything that I had to keep from bawling right then. I'm serious. I had people that come to the church later and said, Brother Tim, I saw you on TV, and I just had to come. I heard your testimony, and I just had to come. The same Jesus who changed your lives and who changed my life is willing to change anybody's life. The same Jesus. And as we close tonight, I know we've gone a little longer, but I told you it would take a little longer. But I want you to know that I keep the seventh day Sabbath because it's the true Lord's day. Because Jesus kept it, he is my example. And the Bible says when <clears throat> he shall appear, we shall be like him. We should seek to be like him now and recognize what he's given to us something very, very special, a day of rest, a day that he blessed and sanctified. He made, gave it to us as a gift to keep holy.